Good evening. I'm B.F. Graham, founder of the Princeton Propellers, and on behalf of the Princeton Area Alumni Association and Quadrangle Club, welcome to tonight's program on offshore aquaculture and world protein demand, commercial incentives to fulfill conservation imperatives. We are coming to you from our Battlefield Parkside Studios in Princeton, New Jersey, USA. And aloha to our friends in Hawaii, where tonight's speaker is coming to us from his headquarters in Kona Kailua on the Big Island, where it is now mid afternoon. And a hearty hello to all points between. And now it's time to introduce our speaker, marine scientist and aquaculture pioneer, Neil Anthony Sims founder and CEO of Ocean Era Inc., formerly known as Kampachi Farms. Ocean Era is a developer of technologies for high value marine fin fish, herbivorous reef fish, and offshore culture of tropical microalgae, AKA seaweed. Neil is going to take us on a deep dive into the world of offshore aquaculture and demonstrate its increasingly salient and crucial role in meeting world protein demand. In particular, he'll describe technical innovations that when properly implemented, let humans be good stewards of the environment and have our fish and eat it too. This important subject has often been dismissed or denigrated in the media owing to past poor practices by businesses and governments, or just general resistance to change. So when we decided to do a program on technologies for sustainable, scalable, affordable, and responsible offshore aquaculture, we sought out a speaker who could do justice to the many facets of this highly complex story. R&D, engineering, environmental issues, policy and regulatory challenges, evolving best practices, and gaining market acceptance. We quickly settled on Neil, who with decades of experience in aquaculture could address all of these aspects. A native of Australia, Neil holds BS degrees in zoology and marine biology from James Cook University of North Queensland and an MS in zoology from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He next worked at the Ministry of Marine Resources for the Cook Islands, which gave him a government perspective. This was followed by stints at various private mariculture companies, which gave him a business perspective. In 2011, he founded the company now known as Ocean Era, where he has pursued the global commercialization of Velella project technologies in open ocean aquaculture. Through it all, Neil has been very active on the world aquaculture stage. He has published widely, in academic journals and the mainstream media, served as an aquaculture consultant and advisor in South America, the Middle East and across the Pacific for private industry, public private consortia, national labs and aquaculture investment funds. And he has shared numerous aquaculture conferences and advisory groups around the world, testified before the US Congress, and was last year awarded two US patents related to aquaculture harvesting systems. For all these reasons, he seemed just the person to propel us through offshore aquaculture's role in meeting world protein demand. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Neil. Aloha, thank you BFG for the introduction. So I'm 
very pleased to be here this evening. And I think it, it's truly insightful of the propellers to recognize the growing importance, the growing profile of aquaculture in general, but particularly of offshore aquaculture. As a marine biologist, I can see the importance of expanding aquaculture, but as an entrepreneur, uh, I like to be able to use commercial incentives to be able to drive these imperatives because just relying on foundations or public funding or the goodwill of humanity clearly isn't going to be enough given the challenges that we face. So I'm going to speak just to describe offshore aquaculture. Often folk are not really clear on what it is and then why we should do this. And then because of th there's a, a lot of concern, particularly in the environmental community and from those who've read about aquaculture, I'm going to address what the actual science says about offshore aquaculture and what the NGO community thinks now, what they have said in the past and how their thinking is evolving. And then the really critical question, why is it not happening here more in the US? And then what are we as a company doing about that? How are we start to, starting to address these imperatives? So what exactly is offshore aquaculture? There's a lot of effort has been spent in the past trying to define offshore aquaculture by the depth of water or the height of waves or the fetch of exposure. To my mind, really, when you're talking about offshore aquaculture, it's just deeper water further from shore. And this is a, a very loose definition, but it actually drives at the heart of what we're trying to achieve in offshore aquaculture, which is to be able to work within the ecosystem's assimilative capacities. Net pen culture in the past, because of constraints of engineering and this convenience, has previously, particularly in the, in the 80s and 90s as the technology was developing, been confined to more protected fjords or harbours, just bodies of water that didn't have as much circulation and which weren't as deep. And so you did there encounter biological feedback loops would come back and bite the operators in the buttocks. By moving out into deeper water further offshore, you're essentially becoming an island unto yourself. It becomes more ecologically isolated. And so you, because the, the, the substrate is so far below the net pens, uh, it, it doesn't have that feedback potential there. And this is really critically important as an entrepreneur to think of this because we need to, as I will expound later, we need to be able to grow this industry. We need to be able to scale it. And we can't do that in nearshore waters. Even a country such as Norway, which is so blessed with deep fjords, has realized that all of their expansion has to be further offshore. So then why do we do this? Why do we need to expand aquaculture so much? Well, I started my career in commercial aquaculture working in pearl farm development and this was pearls are for a, a marine resource potential, perhaps the most valuable. And it was wonderful. I, I spent a lot of time flitting around the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, looking at pearl farm sites and uh, developing some pearl farms and pearl oyster hatcheries. But at some stage, we, we started to develop a, a pearl farm here in Hawaii. Uh, this was the, the, the first and actually the only harvest of Hawaiian black pearls. At some stage there, though, trained as a marine biologist and still keeping my ear to the ground of how fisheries science and fishing industries were developing, it started to gnaw at me that here I was just essentially playing with trinkets and baubles whilst all around me Rome burned. And indeed it burned. And anybody who's picked up a newspaper in the last 30 or 40 years has seen graphs like this repeatedly. And People kind of shrug and go, well, yes, that's the boom and bust of fisheries. That's the way it has to be. Well, it doesn't have to be that way, but it seems to be a recurring pattern for uh, humankind to be able to go and overcapitalize fishing fleets. And then the, 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 the challenge in managing those fishing fleets in what really is a stochastic ocean, you can't really predict the unpredictable. And so you get 
things like this, the, the North Atlantic cod stock, which was 800,000 tonnes in the mid 60s and 70s. And in 1992, they shut the fishery down completely. The entire North Atlantic cod fishery was shut down. They kept a couple of fisheries that were day boats that were hand lining cod stocks. They kept those going for a couple more years. They reopened it again just a few years ago because they thought the stocks might be back. And then they very quickly closed it again. The tragedy here, not only did they overfish the cod stocks, but they overfished them to the point where they have not come back. This is 25 years, 28 years since the fishery was first, the, the, the first big crash in the fishery, and they have not come back. And that's a fairly chilling realization that, that those of us in fishery science and marine science look at and realize that, that we can't keep doing things the way that we've always been doing them. There was a study done in 2004 by Myers and Worm that had found that 90% of the big fish in the ocean were already gone. We took them. They didn't just go of their own volition. We have taken those. And so it, it's more than just fish stocks now, though, a, a, as we are recognizing that the, the, the global imperatives here down on the left hand side of, of this slide here, the issues that we as a planet need to start to address. Uh, and our company and me individually, we think, well, okay, there are two main areas here where we can start to address these needs here, these planetary needs, where we can contribute. And one is to develop more macro algae. This is seaweed, macro as opposed to micro, which is uh, the single cell uh, plant organisms in the ocean. Macro algae is what you know as seaweeds. And we are working to develop uh, macro algae offshore culture systems. And we're also working to develop marine based foods, essentially fish, various species of fish as alternatives to beef and pork because of the, the, the global footprint of terrestrial animal protein production, marine based sources are considered much more uh, scalable. And, and there is a recognition now that there's more need for marine based foods. Just recently, there was a United Nations high level panel uh, on global climate change and the oceans. And one of their five major recommendations was that humanity must transition from terrestrial food sources to more marine, marine sourced foods. And whilst freshwater fish offer a lot of potential in terms of providing protein to feed the masses, I got some, some of my best friends are, are, are catfish farmers. Freshwater fish cannot compete with beef or with pork in, in terms of, of palate appeal we want to be able to allow market drivers to achieve the change that, that we, we need here. We don't want to force people to be eating carp or catfish or tilapia. You can't force them to, unless it's a world that I don't want to live in where you go into a, a steakhouse or a seafood restaurant and all that is available is a freshwater fish. If you're serving freshwater fish at a steakhouse, people are going to invariably go and eat the beef. We need to be offering appealing alternatives that people will preferentially select over the beef and the pork. And there's also then not just this shift in diet that we need to see. We need to also be countering the growth in the, the planetary population, the increasing affluence and the increasing health consciousness here. And so there's going to be additional demand for fish anyway. And this as you remember the, the former slides of the, the crash of fisheries, this cannot come from just fishing harder. We can't squeeze any more blood out of that stone. We have to figure out how to grow the seafood that we need to meet these shortfalls and to then be able to start to displace terrestrial animal proteins. The estimates are that we need at least another 40 million metric tons. And that's about a 50% increase on top of what aquaculture is already doing. And we need to be able to do this within the next 20 years or so. So one way that we have started to address this here in Hawaii was by developing offshore culture systems for 
for example, the, the, the Kona Kampachi, which is a close relative of the Japanese Hamachi, the, the, the Japanese yellowtail that you may have encountered in restaurants. It's the same genus there. And we had developed an offshore fish farm operation here in Hawaii that was producing this fish. It was tremendous as an aquaculture species because it grew really quickly, got to a size of four to five pounds in about 12 months. It was very efficient from a feed conversion efficiency perspective, which is important both from an ecological uh, viewpoint that you want to be able to produce maximum amount of fish from the minimal amount of inputs. But it's also critically important from a commercial perspective because feed is 60 or 70 percent of the cost of goods from an offshore aquaculture operation. And so if you can optimize the use of that feed, that then your product is more affordable there. One of the beauties of the Kona Kampachi was that it just, it was a phenomenal fish from a, a culinary perspective. It works both as sashimi and then also a, as a cooked product. So it could also be not just served in high-end sushi restaurants, but also a center of the plate. And so this was the first fish that we began to work with in offshore aquaculture. And it helped us recognize the potential if we grow this industry. So through that process of developing Kampachi operation here, we, we had a lot of active involvement with the NGO community and with the science community, collecting data around these operations. And we're able to now address and usually dispel a lot of the concerns that folk often have, the negative associations that people have with aquaculture. We've been able to demonstrate that with offshore aquaculture, you can have minimal environmental impacts. You actually, the fish perform better offshore and there's evidence of, of better health. And there are also phenomenal fishing and aquaculture synergies as you start to move out offshore. So in terms of the environmental impacts, the main concern that people have is water quality. They have this vision of, of plumes of, of tainted effluent water down current of fish pens. And what we've been able to show both through the monitoring data around the Kona operation and other offshore fish farm sites in Panama, we've been able to show that there is minimal environmental impact. We've been able to model that. I mean, it's not that difficult to model nitrogen and phosphorus effluents from a, a, a fish pen operation. We can model the global climate. So modeling a couple of elements when you know the inputs and you know the, the, the processes inside the net pen, that's fairly uh, trivial is the wrong word. It's, it's certainly achievable to be able to model that. There's also an accumulation of anecdotal evidence around offshore net pens and then it's also, we've been able to move it to the, the level of personal experience in marketing the product. So the monitoring and modeling, we want to think of this both from a global perspective. What is, what is the global footprint of aquaculture? And then also the, the local perspective. And globally, there are a couple of studies that I think are, are really seminal. The first is the Blue Frontiers study from 2011, which was World Fish International, which is an aquaculture development NGO based down in Malaysia uh, that had previously been, been set up by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and Conservation International, the, one of the leading conservation voices in the NGO community had collaborated in this Blue Frontier study that had looked at the, the uh, overall life cycle analysis, the impacts uh, from land use, freshwater use, greenhouse gas emissions of aquaculture versus the other forms of animal protein production. And their conclusion was that hands down, far and away, aquaculture is the least impactful form of animal protein production. More recently, there's been a lot of work come out of the University of California, Santa Barbara Bren School. Uh, the, the, the paper by Gentry and Froelich and others in 2017 had looked at the global potential to scale offshore aquaculture and they put some constraints around how they would see this scaling. They put a limit of depth of, let's go no deeper than 200 meters offshore. And let's exclude all of the areas where there might be shipping or recreation or oil and gas rigs or communication needs, exclude all of the other uh, conflicting uses in, in uh, the, these 
these offshore waters. And they had concluded that you would be able to produce over 100 times the current level of global seafood production in these offshore waters on the ocean and to be able to do that sustainably. You could produce it. They went further and said, well, okay, that's the entire planet, but how much water surface area would we need to be able to produce, say, the current level of seafood consumption globally? And it turns out that it's about an area the size of Lake Michigan. From a local perspective, there's abundant evidence that's been documented by the National Ocean Service and NOAA under this seminal study by Price and Morris that had found that so long as net pens were located in water that was sufficiently deep, at least as deep again as the net pen is, and in waters where there was reasonable current, that there was no significant impact and often no measurable impact. You couldn't even detect that the net pens were there when you're looking at the substrate. And then there was work by Rust et al. This is uh, authors who were from NOAA and from the Nature Conservancy and from academia. And they had looked at all of the impacts. Price and Morris had just looked at water quality and benthic impacts. And Rust et al. had looked at all of the impacts from net pen operations just in the US waters, examples in the US waters. And it concluded that there was no significant impact at all from those. And as I alluded to earlier, that there are powerful models that allow us to do this. And so Jack Rensel uh, and a group from USC have developed an aqua model, which allows the modeling of these nutrients and allows us to predict the carrying capacity, uh, which is really important in terms of, it's great to monitor and to model, but ultimately you have to manage. Even offshore, you're going to bump up against constraints at some point. So you need to be able to predict the carrying capacity and then manage around that. The anecdotal evidence is I think best represented by this. Perhaps some of you have been wondering what, what is this image uh, in, in the background here? This is a galvanized steel float, subsurface float at about seven meters depth on the Kampachi farm site uh, offshore here in, in Kona, Hawaii. And what you can see here, the, the reason why this is such a rough surface here is that this is coral, opera, which is the dominant reef building coral here in Hawaii and until the more recent bleaching events. Uh, generally, everybody associates coral with good water quality. This buoy was about 20 meters down current of eight net pens of Kampachi that were producing around 500 tons of Kampachi a year. And it is literally covered with this opera coral. And then the personal experience, we've increasingly recognized the value of people need to be able to tell stories and particularly signature chefs need to be able to tell the stories of the, 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 uh, the provenance of, of the products that they're serving. And so this is Iron Chef Morimoto diving with us out on, on the offshore uh, net pens here in Kona. He wasn't the most water confident uh, chef that I've ever had, but, but he was bold enough to get on a mask and snorkel and get in there with the fish. And this is down at the farm site in Mexico where we had a group of a dozen of Mexico's leading chefs out on the farm site, snorkeling around the net pens. And these chefs are then willing, they're enthusiastic about going back and telling the story about what they've seen uh, with the fish production systems. As a fish farmer, you're also looking for where are there additional payoffs? You want to not just have minimal impact, but you want to also look for benefits here. And there's a lot of evidence accumulating now that in offshore waters, you get better fish performance. And this was the, the, the perhaps best study on this to date was by Nicole Kirchhoff and colleagues down in uh, South Australia, where they were studying Southern bluefin tuna uh, stocks in net pens that are in shallower water and further offshore and measuring a lot of the stress hormones and uh, the other performance of the fish and found a clear difference. Fish in deeper water further offshore experience less stress. We've seen this ourselves with our Velella project, Neo Benedenia, the, 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 uh, it's a flatworm, it's a parasitic uh, flatworm that, that affects the fish as an ectoparasite. Uh, that we saw significantly less infect infection rates in this in offshore systems. And also in Chile, there was evidence of, of salmon rickettsia syndrome and calagus levels 
are significantly reduced in deeper water further offshore. We've also seen evidence of better growth and survival. The, the Kampachi in the, the first iteration of the Velella project here in Kona, the unanchored drifter pen, the growth rate there was about twice as fast as the growth rate that we'd seen in other offshore pens. So even as you go further out offshore, this net pen was in water that was 6,000 to 12,000 feet deep uh, and it drifted around for eight months in the back of, in the eddies in the back of the big island. And the fish performance was absolutely phenomenal. And the survival of the fish was phenomenal as well. And that's also been validated by some work with an offshore net pen operator uh, in Israel uh, with, with sea brim production. The evidence of better fish health, the, the sea lice, uh, which is a common issue in salmon management, is also common on wild kampachi or kahalo as they're called here in Hawaii. And yet we've never found sea lice on any of the fish in the net pens that we're culturing here in Hawaii. And yet the, the neobenedenia, the skin flukes, they will occur, they'll proliferate on, on the fish inside of the net pens here. But we found no increase. And this was extensive monitoring of, of, of wild stocks here that there's no increase in skin flukes. So there's, we're not seeing in offshore systems, we're not seeing a transmission of parasites from the net pen into the wild stocks. And I'd also spoken about the, the fishing and aquaculture synergies that we're seeing in offshore aquaculture. And this was here the, the second iteration of the Valella project uh, here in Hawaii, the, Kona. The initial one, the, the unanchored pen, was called the Valella beta test. Uh, and that drifted around, as I said, in, in the eddies in the back of the big island here. And it proved to be a phenomenal fish aggregating device. Local fishermen, commercial fishermen, charter boat fishermen, recreational fishermen loved it because they could be catching tuna and marlin and mahi-mahi hand over fist around these pens. We don't really understand why fish are drawn to floating objects like this, but it is something in their behavior in the open ocean. Perhaps they just, they like to be able to orient around structures there. Uh, and so when we came in with the second iteration of the Velella project in the, the gamma test, and this was moored, you can see the mooring buoy here in, in the, the yellow double buoy there in the foreground. And then this in the foreground from that is, is the feed barge, the hoppers on the feed barge. And then here's half a dozen, eight or so boats out around this pen here. This is typical of what you would see on any morning between 10, 15, 20 boats fishing around this. The beauty of this was that it was moored and so the fishermen knew where it was every morning. So this here is an example of the potential benefits that the fishing community might be able to enjoy from the growth of offshore aquaculture. So when you integrate all of this together, you, you look at the, the, the concerns that people have had about aquaculture in the past and there's been this uh, focus on we don't want it to have any impact. And these are the sorts of reasons that fo folk will list where, where, what they want to see in, in aquaculture. No deterioration of water quality or benthic habitat, no impact on wild stocks, and also reducing the impact on forage fish. What I am actually positing here is that rather than just asking no impact, we want to be able to start to look more closely at the beneficial impacts here. And instead of no deterioration of water quality, we can look at the increased productivity from the nutrient flows there and the carbon capture that we can see in offshore aquaculture. The benthic habitat, rather than just looking for no detriment, we want to be able to see if there can be greater biomass and biodiversity if we're siting these net pens in the right location. Instead of no impact on wild stocks, let's look for these bad effects. And if we want to protect those stocks, then perhaps we can establish wild stock refuges around uh, these operations. And the reduced impact on forage fish, some of, of the, the rough estimates that we've done with uh, looking at the, the, trans, the nutrient movement from forage fish, such as sardines or anchovies or herring, the movement of that through wild stocks versus farm stocks, that farm stocks are perhaps 60 times more efficient than wild stock. So if your, your goal is to manage your ocean resources to maximize the potential fish that we can extract from that sustainably, then you absolutely, we need to be looking at 
uh, at offshore aquaculture. The fat effects and wild stock refuge, we've been able to see this. This is an image taken from underneath the, the, the net pens uh, in Kona, where you can see fish that are attracted around this, the increased biomass and productivity. And then perhaps there's a compatibility to be found with marine protected areas and fish farms. A lot of the objections from the fishing community to establishment of marine protected areas is that you're going to reduce the amount of fish supply that can come into, uh, in, into the market. But by using offshore aquaculture in these areas where there's no detriment to the rest of the surrounding ecosystem, you can actually increase the amount of seafood that would flow into, into the local markets. And then there's also a lot that we uh, need to consider now about the growth of macroalgae. This is an area where we have got increasing focus in our company. The term marine agronomy is now used uh, a, a lot more in this field. This is uh, macroalgae culture in Dalian in China. This is nearshore culture systems here. But China, Korea, Japan, there are massive sea macroalgae seaweed culture industries there that have these ecological services of removing nutrients, sequestering carbon dioxide, and providing structure in the ocean that increases uh, biodiversity and productivity. And so we are in the, at the threshold now being able to, to move these sorts of technologies from these near shore sites where it's very protected bays, move this out offshore. So by using macroalgae and bivalves and fish in culture systems out offshore, the, the, the consensus now from the science is that the oceans, we should start to view them more as part of the solution to that which ails the planet rather than uh, being just merely a victim of the global climate crisis. That's the science. We all know that there's a huge gap between the science and the general populist perceptions. The conduit to most of that is from the NGOs, environmental NGOs. And this has been particularly so in aquaculture. And I would posit that we've seen a, a really significant, significant shift in the conventional wisdom over the last 15 years or so. If you go back to 2006, you might all remember this story. It was uh, publicized in, in the New York Times and, and a num number of other journals. It was a, a, an article in Science by Boris Worm and Associates that had extrapolated from global fisheries data the trend of collapsed fish stocks. And this is stocks that were down to less than 10% of their original biomass. And the prediction, it was just a prediction based on the existing data, was that by 2048, if we didn't change our relationship with the oceans, by 2048, all fish stocks would have been collapsed. Okay, it's a prediction. There, there's, there's been a lot of uh, lively debate within, within the fishery science community that uh, has disputed that projection. Uh, so it was a projection, not a prediction. But it helped to highlight, I think, in, in, in the, the public sentiment that the issue that the oceans were no longer boundless. The New York Times magazine had a story on the end of tuna. And the Washington Post had a story on the end of fish. And there was a time article cover page story and, and a documentary about the end of the line. Nobody was really sure what it was the end of, but people came to the realization around this time in, in, in the late noughties that there was a limitation to how much we could squeeze out of wild fish stocks. And that was something that we fisheries biologists had been seeing for the last 20, 30 years. Yet still, even in around 2004, there was a lot of negative uh, postulation around the idea of offshore aquaculture. This was from the Ocean Conservancy. And yes, they have taken it down off their, their website, but it still reverberates around the internet as, as sen sensationalist images will. But this highlights the negative hypothesis that, that, that aquaculture is going to result in negative impacts. And it just it lists all of these in, in, in a... Um, exaggerated manner uh, and doesn't highlight any of the ways that we could mitigate those potential impacts or any of the benefits that might flow. So that was 2004 and, 
by around 2018, there was more of a receptivity to the idea of this null hypothesis. There was enough data that we, we generated from offshore aquaculture projects here in Kona, Panama, elsewhere throughout the world, that there's no significant impact. What I'm actually saying going forward is that we really should be looking at the positive hypothesis here rather than the null hypothesis, that, that there's, there are positive impacts from offshore aquaculture that could promote productivity and biodiversity. And this has become increasingly recognized by the NGO community. Originally, there was the, the Blue Frontier study that I've alluded to earlier from Conservation International and Worldfish. And then uh, in 2017, one of the leaders from Conservation International came out on their blog and said, offshore farming is the biggest opportunity to grow and steer aquaculture towards sustainability. Thank you very much. Conservation International. They're letting the science drive their thinking, which is wonderfully reassuring. The Nature Conservancy also is now starting to highlight the potential for offshore net pen production uh, in their discussions around smart growth in aquaculture. And I've mentioned earlier the work at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, it, it's a bit of an alphabet soup there, but it's the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis and SNAP is an acronym that I can't remember anymore, something about nutrition and productivity. But they've done a lot of work looking at uh, offshore aquaculture in, in the public discourse. And th this study here from uh, Frontiers of Marine Science looked at the number of citations per publication, uh, not number of citations per year uh, that had mentioned offshore aquaculture. And then they've also done work analyzing the sentiment around offshore aquaculture, positive versus negative. And the goal is to track those changes over time. Yes, you can see there for the US, it's about 50-50, the, 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 uh, the sentiment around offshore aquaculture there. The really interesting thing about the UCSB work, not the, not the really, one of the many interesting things, because they've done some phenomenal work uh, out of there. Uh, one of the most compelling things is who is funding this work. And whereas previously up until around 2008, most of the foundation funding that flowed into the seafood sector was driving the sentiment that aquaculture was a problem and needed to be constrained. What we are seeing now is that Packard and Moore and other large foundations are starting to fund these sorts of programs at UCSB that are looking at how do we grow this industry in the most responsible manner? And that is tremendously gratifying for us to see. So then it's wonderful, right? You've got an offshore fish farm right outside your door. That's where you go and you get your fresh seafood from all the time. No, not in the US. Offshore aquaculture is moving forward in Norway and China and Mexico. In the US, there are constraints here. And the biological and technological challenges we've been able to address. What we haven't yet been able to resolve are the regulatory challenges that we, we face here in the US. And then that has inhibited the flow of money into developing the technologies, the systems that might be able to uh, help us mitigate the impacts as we grow the industry there. I want to just highlight some of the technological advances that we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years in this industry. Perhaps the biggest is in mesh materials. And when you're talking about a net pen operation, the net is a critical element of that. It's really important to be able to keep your fish on one side of the net and the sharks on the other side of the net. If you get them mixed up, it just doesn't work nearly as well. Mm -hmm. And so in the last 10, 15 years, we've seen developments of copper alloy materials, these essentially chain link materials there that Yes, it's copper base, it's a brass, it's breathtakingly expensive, uh, but it is, uh, reduces the potential for predator interaction and it has no biofouling there as well. There's also Dyneema Predator X material, which is a, it's a Kevlar and stainless steel wire. And then there's a KikoNet, which is a polyphthalate, terephthalate material. It's, it's a monofilament plastic. Uh, that essentially lasts forever and is very, very resistant. I had an Australian barramundi, far barramundi farmer 
uh, from North Queensland tell me that, crikey, mate, it keeps crocodiles out. If it's a net pen that keeps crocodiles out, then that, that's, that's good enough for me. And so these materials now, we're able to both reduce or eliminate. You can never completely eliminate the risk of escape, but to reduce it to where it is de minimis risk. That, and that also then reduces the potential for predation or predator entanglement, which is an issue in a lot of nylon nets there. And then, as I'd said, with the, the, the monofilament work or with, with the uh, copper alloy material, there's less biofouling on the mesh. And so that allows a better flow of water through the netting. It's better for fish health uh, and, and lowers the feed conversion ratio because the fish are getting more oxygen. I do want to just highlight the, the Dyneema material here. There's some spectacular uh, video footage online of them testing this material. Everybody loves a shark video. They're strapping the dead fish inside th this cage uh, that you see behind here. And then this is over in the Bahamas and you can see the sharks circling around here. They set a camera up there. It, it's, if you go and Google Dyneema Predator X, you, you, you'll find that it, it, it's a, a great bit of YouTube sensationalism. Part of the other technological advances though is that we're able to now scale up this industry as the engineering is becoming increasingly advanced. There are uh, net pens now 7,000 cubic meters in, in volume. That's, that's the encompassed volume of the net pen. And these are about 10 miles off the Panama coast. Uh, this open blue company that's growing Colbia in these has 30 of these pens in production there now. And globally, there's been a, a, a tremendous scale up of, of this industry. And I, I would actually posit that it's not these, this chart here indicates all those areas for what I would call exposed water commercial operations of fish, uh, non salmonids, which is fish other than salmon in, in, in the marine environment. And so this is sort of where is offshore now at, at the moment. You'll see there's a lot of it in the Mediterranean. And you think of the Mediterranean as a pond. No, because it ha has storms come through there. It has a very short uh, wave fetch. And so you'll get very destructive short wave period, uh, short period wave energy there. That is, that's some of the most challenging offshore sites that are being farmed commercially. But yet there's around 600,000 tons a year of sea bass and sea brim that comes out of the Mediterranean. But I'd also like to draw your attention to the fact this is a non-salmonid fish. But when you look at where salmon are being farmed in increasingly offshore locations, down particularly in Chile and Newfoundland and Iceland and Norway, that people are moving net pens out as the operating operators and the governments are recognizing the carrying capacity limits of their, their environment. They're moving them out into deeper water, further from shore, more exposed. There are sites in Newfoundland now that have fetch, uh, the nearest land fetch to the south is Brazil, and then behind that is Antarctica. So you have the full brunt of the North Atlantic. Now, some of these are fairly sophisticated operations. Uh, this is a, a, a pillbox feed barge. Uh, that It's a concrete feed barge that is very heavily ballasted and designed to take waves of 30, 40, 50 feet in a fjord in, in Scotland. And the net pens are designed to be able to, it's a flexible HDPE pipe net pen. They're designed to be able to ride through those waves as well. And this is a sort of sea conditions that, that these net pens will experience. This is uh, net pens in the Canary Islands, again, exposed to the full brunt of the North Atlantic. And people are farming fish in these systems. These are the surface system. Once you're able to get a submersible cage and put it down below the surface, you can be in even more exposed waters. And the salmon industry is moving in this direction. This, uh, this operation here by, by Nordlax, it's one of the major salmon producers in Norway. This is currently being built in China. Uh, and this is over 400 meters long, this uh, net pen system. It's designed to be permanently on the surface, but because it will swivel on a, on a single point mooring, it can just put poke its bow into any of the weather that, that is moving towards it. This is not being built. This has been built and deployed. This is about the size of a, a, a large oil rig. Uh, it's called by Salmar, again, one of the largest 
salmon producers in Norway, built in China, and then towed from China to Norway. It's called the Ocean Farm One system. And this is it when it is deployed, when it, it, it is submerged here. Salmar has already completed uh, two harvests, two cohorts, two batches of fish. Each of these batches of fish had 1.5 million salmon in this system here. Ocean Farm is now, the, the, sorry, Salmar is now building Ocean Farm 2, which will be twice the size of this, and it will accept up to 3 million salmon per cohort. So how viable is this? Watch where the people go. The CEO and the CFO of Salmar recently left the parent company and joined the offshore subsidiary to head up the offshore subsidiary. They see the potential for these sorts of systems and they want to be part of that growth. So we can resolve these biological and technological challenges. What are we doing about the regulatory and the financial challenges here? I think the financial challenges will flow from if we can resolve the regulatory constraints. But here in the US, there is a lot of resistance to the idea of growth of this industry, particularly in federal waters. And this is based on these negative associations that are 15 or 20 years old uh, from the aquaculture industry for, from how it was previously. What we've seen here evolving over the last five to 10 years, uh, NOAA moved forward with a, a, a fisheries management plan. NOAA is the agency responsible for management of fisheries in federal waters here. They moved forward with a fisheries management plan in the Gulf of Mexico, recognizing that that was a body of water that had a lot of potential for growth uh, of offshore aquaculture in the US. They took 10 years to go through uh, the lengthy process of listening sessions throughout the nation and then putting together an EA with the fisheries management plan. And then when the Deepwater Horizon happened, they went and they redid their entire EA because they figured it might be impacted by the findings of the Deepwater Horizon. And they came back with a fisheries management plan and they put it out there uh, in 2016. Uh, in 2018, this, this fisheries management plan was appealed by, I wouldn't call them the environment, elements of the environmental community, they're elements of the anti-aquaculture community. And they had said that under the, the legislation that, that gives NOAA responsibility for fisheries in federal waters, that aquaculture didn't really count. Aquaculture is growing fish and not just harvesting fish. And there was, in, in 2018, there was a a decision in Louisiana that, uh, yes, that was indeed the case. That's now being appealed. Uh, and that then took away the responsibility for NOAA to manage aquaculture in federal waters. It didn't say, we're not going to have any aquaculture in federal waters. It said, NOAA, you, <laughs> the agency with all the fisheries biologists in it, you have no say in management of aquaculture in federal waters. And so then the responsibility fell to to who? Well, it's actually into a bit of a black box now. We are moving forward with uh, what's called the Aqua Act. Washington DC loves a good acronym. Uh, it's, it's the Advancing the Quality and Understanding of American Aquaculture Act. Give somebody credit for that acronym, please. This has got bipartisan support. Hawaii's own Senator Schatz uh, is a co-sponsor of this, along with uh, Senator Wicker uh, from Mississippi. Uh, and both in, in the, that's been also introduced into the House and into the Senate. Uh, and this builds on a consensus. There has been, a, Senator Schatz comes from the, the deep green end of, of the Democratic Party spectrum. He, he's a, a deeply committed uh, environmental activist. I've known him for at least 20 years when, when we were first getting legislation on aquaculture through here in Hawaii. And he, he was a state legislator. Uh, and the fact that he has signed off on this means he's getting air cover from these leading environmental NGOs that I've spoken of previously. And so there's, I think, a lot of hope that that legislation will uh, change. But we're moving forward with uh, our own initiatives also in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, back in 2016, when the fisheries management plan was first introduced, Ocean Era or Compachi Farms, as we, we were known back then, because we loved our Compachi. Uh, 
ocean era, we sat there for a year and a half and watched nobody else start to apply for a permit for aquaculture in the Gulf of Mexico, even though there was this governing fisheries management plan. And the reason is most of them were just so daunted by the prospect of the, the, the phalanx of permits that you need to obtain and the public hearing process uh, and addressing all of the concerns of Endangered Species Act and Clean Water Act and, and uh, essential fish habitat constraints uh, under, under uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act. It's a pretty daunting gauntlet. And we felt ourselves, we really should be moving forward with, with uh, a, an application here that, that somebody needs to step forward and blaze a trail here through, through the permitting pathway. And so we began that process initially with NOAA as the lead agency. And then when the Louisiana court decision happened, we were a little crestfallen for about a day. And then I got a phone call from the head of EPA in the region who had said, hey, don't want you to fret about your permit. We really uh, recognize the, the value of all the good work that you've put into this to date. And EPA is going to assume the lead agency role here in moving this permit forward. So we're very gratified that. And that's your federal tax dollars hard at work. So thank you all very much. So what else is ocean? If this is such an imperative, I want to just quickly now roll out in what else we are doing as a company about this. As I'd said, we're, we're working both with macroalgae and with uh, marine fish production to address the, these issues here. The macroalgae work uh, is we're targeting five uh, main goals here of how we will commercialize this. We, it's not just enough to go out and grow macroalgae and, and hope that you can feel good about it. You've got to be able to scale this. And the profit motive is really, we think the best uh, mechanism for scaling the sorts of growth that we want to see. So we're targeting here the human food market, the, uh, both the, the, the two macroalgae you see here. One is the ogo that's used in the, the poke, the raw fish dish here in Hawaii. The other, uh, the, the green uh, there, we, we call that vegan caviar, that, that's colerpa. Uh, which is considered a, a different species of calerpa is considered noxious, invasive in a number of areas. But this species of calerpa is, it, it, it's a spectacular taste sensation. I don't want to oversell it. You will get some to you at some stage here to a market near, near you. There's also potential to use it for feed, either for terrestrial livestock. There's a lot of interest in growing asparagopsis to feed to cattle because it the bromoforms in the asparagopsis will sequester methane production in the cattle. And so you can have cows that don't burp methane. The, the impact on greenhouse gas emissions from that is potentially tremendous. But we also see opportunity for uh, taking seaweed and feeding it to marine fish, either through some digestion process to make a single celled protein available to carnivorous fish like Kampachi, or just take the seaweed and feed it to an herbivorous fish. There's tremendous potential to use seaweeds. Some seaweeds are already used as fertilizers uh, because of, of, of the, uh, the, the micronutrients that are available in, in seaweeds. But we see a greater potential for this if you could be using, for, uh, using seaweeds as a mechanism to concentrate nitrogen out of the ocean and then use it as a nitrogen, the primary nitrogen source in a fertilizer. Most of the industrial production of nitrogen fertilizers now use, uses what's called the Harbor Bosch process, which is very energy intensive. It takes a lot of energy to take inorganic nitrogen out of the atmosphere and turn it into nitrites or nitrates or ammonia. And if we could be using seaweeds to do that, not only are you then pulling carbon out of the oceans and countering ocean acidification, but you're also reducing the energy demand for these other nitrogen fertilizers. This work is of interest enough to the US Department of Energy. We've got a couple of projects that are funded under ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, both for developing the offshore macroalgae uh, culture systems, but then also for uh, using the, the microbiome of herbivorous reef fish, fish that naturally eat seaweed, using their microbiome, the bacteria in their guts, as a model for how we might be able to turn seaweed into energy or, or sashimi. And then there's also a growing interest in the potential for sequestration of seaweed. Use seaweed as a tool to, for carbon capture and storage 
out of the, pulling carbon out of surface waters and then perhaps sequestering it to the abyssal plain. And this is not just Neil talking, this is also Alexandria Cousteau, who's heading up the Oceans 2050 initiative, uh, is really leading the, the, the work there. Our macroalgae R&D here in Kona at the moment, it's still very small scale. Uh, we're focused on uh, identifying those species which have the best growth rates and those which we can sporulate in, in the hatchery uh, and, and then be able to have them settle onto strings to be able to move them out to an offshore site. Most of the macroalgae that's grown in the tropics to date is very manually intensive, uh, labor intensive. You actually have to tie the pieces of macroalgae onto strings and we're not gonna change the global climate uh, by, by that. Um, but so both for sargassum and for ulva, the, the, the sea lettuce that you see here, we've been able to develop systems for sporulating those. And the growth rates are, are, of these macroalgae, the ulva is around 10% per day. We've had gracilaria growth rates of almost 30% per day. That's really appealing when you're looking at uh, potential for uh, higher use of this as carbon sequestration or as a biofuels or fertilizer. And we are permitted now and we are funded. Uh, we're moving forward with the engineers to deploy uh, this uh, offshore experimental array out off the coast of Kona in Hawaii. It'll be in about 150 meters depth of water. It will pull up the deep seawater, the nutrient rich deep seawater the reason why tropical oceans are so, such a beautiful pristine blue is they've got no nutrients in them. It's a desert out there. So by pulling up the nutrient rich deep sea water, essentially an artificial upwelling, we hope to be able to promote the macroalgae growth on this array. In terms of the food production systems there, we're addressing this challenge by more scalable, sustainable feedstuffs, herbivorous fish, and then the permitting work that I alluded to. The feedstuff work just in this last year, we had some, we've been working at this with funding from uh, NOAA, the Department of Commerce, uh, individual private companies and the US soybean industry. We've been working on this for about the last 15 years. And just this last year, we were able to put our hands around that gold ring. We've now been out the Kampachi diets, which Kampachi is one of these so-called carnivorous marine fish. It's not really carnivorous, it doesn't need to eat fish any more than your cat needs to eat small birds. Your cat's going to be perfectly happy if it, no, it's not, sorry, cats are never perfectly happy. Your cat's going to shut up for a minute if you feed it with a diet that a veterinarian has formulated. So it's got the right proteins and oil balance in there, similarly for fish. And so we have been working with some of the best fish nutritionists in the nation with the support from the F3 net network, the Anthropocene Institute funded by uh, members of the, the, the Google founder family. Uh, and this work allowed us to be able to refine the diet for these so-called carnivorous fish. So we're able to completely eliminate all of the fish meal and fish oil from the diet. We're able to do this by upcycling feed grade poultry meal, poultry meal that you might ordinarily have fed to your cat. Let's feed it to the fish. And then also using a fish oil replacement from a microalgae that is grown wait for it, in Nebraska, that Vera Maris has established in an old ethanol plant, a mechanism to grow this microalgae that's a facultative heterotroph, so they can grow it on corn oil and molasses and produce fish oils, EPA and DHA. And we're able to blend in just enough of that to be able to meet the fish's nutritional requirements and then the consumer's nutritional needs as well. And the growth performance on this zero fish meal, zero fish oil diet was statistically comparable to that of the standard fish meal, fish oil diet there. So that is the real holy grail for us to be able to move marine fish production onto a, a more scalable, sustainable footing. We're also doing a lot of work with kyphosids, which is the family of rudderfish or chubs. And, and the beauty of them is that they eat seaweed. They're an herbivore. They're feeding at the base of the food chain. And this is a fish that is very highly regarded in, in, in the pantheon of reef fish in the Pacifics and Southeast Asia. And we figure here that you could feed them with tilapia diet and they'll taste like a snapper. 
actually we can get even better growth than on a tilapia diet. But this orange, this curve here, the blue curve is the tilapia diet. The orange curve here is a fish, diet, so is a diet that is fed to the fish that is 80% freshwater plants. It's duckweed. It's duckweed is highly invasive. It's a nuisance, but it's very high in protein. It's an herbivorous protein, so that the herbivorous fish can thrive on this. We think it's got tremendous potential as we scale up. And then just to recap then, then the, the, the permitting work that we, we've been doing to pioneer permitting here, we had established the first Kampachi operation here in Kona uh, back in, in 2004. And this was an integrated land-based hatchery. So we're producing all of the fingerlings and the land-based facility that you see here in the upper left-hand corner. And then the net pens out offshore there were these submersible sea station net pens here. There were 3,000 cubic meters each. And we were able to produce 500 tons of sashimi grade kampachi uh, per year up until 2009. We operated that pen. 2009, if you remember, everybody ran out of money in 2009. So we had to sell it at that time to another company that came in that continued to operate it through until just uh, 2019 when it was acquired by Kuna Del Mar, which is a um, impact investor fund focused on offshore aquaculture that is supported by uh, individuals from the, the Walmart, Walton family. As I mentioned earlier, we had uh, also pioneered some work in federal waters that previous fish farm had been in state waters, but our first uh, attempt in federal waters here was the Valella beta test in 2011 and 2012. This was this unanchored drifter pen operation that was supported by the National Science Foundation and by Illinois Soybean Association as well. It was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 25 best inventions of the year in 2012, which was, hey, that's some great PR, but you know, it wasn't really our invention. We were just the ones that were first ones that were dumb enough to try a fish pen with no anchor. Part of this was just the eddies in the back of the big island here as the water moves from the Americas across to Asia, east, east to west, that uh, it sets up eddies here in the back of the big island where we could have this net pen and train there. We weren't complete idiots. We did have a, a, a 80 foot steel hulled vessel there. You can see up on the left hand side behind that diver, uh, a, a steel hulled schooner was attached to the pen. Uh, but that was the net pen operation that had such phenomenal growth and, and survival there. And it also proved to be, a, as I said, a tremendous fad for the Kona fishermen. Recognizing the challenges of commercial operations in US waters, we did go down uh, and set up a, a Campachi operation down in the Sea of Cortez uh, near La Paz, uh, which is close to Cabo, close to the tip of the Sea of Cortez, inside the Bay of La Paz here. Uh, it's four miles offshore. These net pens here that you see are all submersible. So normally the net pens, all you will see here is the orange floats on the surface here. Uh, there's six of those submersible pens in the array and we're very gratified uh, in 2019, we went through the aquaculture stewardship certification process. For those that aren't familiar with ASC is the equivalent of the Marine Stewardship Council, which is that's the label that you all look for when you go and you look for wild seafood, isn't it? Yeah, th thank you, thank you. You all do look for the MSC label. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council is the same sort of certification label. It's a very rigorous process, the, probably the, the most rigorous certification process for aquaculture in the world for cultured seafood. And we were able to have uh, the Campachi on the Mexican farm certified uh, by ASC there in 2019. And then I, I mentioned earlier, we're moving forward with the next iteration of the Valela project in the Gulf of Mexico. And this will be the goal here is to pioneer the permitting in US federal waters. And to do that, we want to have a demonstration pen, first of all, so that the local community, fishing and boating community, can come to understand that offshore aquaculture is really just fish in the water. It's nothing to be scared of, so long as it's managed properly and monitored properly. So this will be a, a small pen of around 20,000 fish. We're partnering with NOAA and, and the National Sea Grant, University of Florida, University of Miami, Moat Marine Lab, and Cargill has kindly offered to provide the feed for us in, in that operation. We're also now moving forward, recognizing 
act, think globally, act locally, we really should be pushing the envelope further here in Hawaii. And so we are moving forward with, there was previously a, a farm offshore of Ever Beach in Oahu. Uh, this map here shows this is Honolulu. Here's Waikiki where that's where you all think of Hawaii. There's a lot more to Hawaii beyond Waikiki. Over here on the other side of Pearl Harbor. Uh, this was a net pen operation that, that operated uh, between 1999 and 2013 uh, and then had issues. The fish that they were growing there is, is a moi, you see up in the right hand corner of the screen here, very highly prized in the local market, but didn't really gain the market traction uh, on, on the mainland. Our plan here is to go and to reactivate this site and then to be culturing the nuē, the herbivorous fish that I spoke of earlier, and limu, the Hawaiian word for seaweed, to be culturing the seaweed down, downstream of the, the nuē, and also to be culturing moi, because there is a very strong local market demand for the moi here. And so our plan is to move the, the, the nuē into commercial culture. Uh, it is such a, a, a highly prized local fish. And for us to be able to grow an herbivorous fish, to be able to demonstrate the commercial viability of that, that is consummation devoutly to be wished. So offshore aquaculture, the one question that remains then is what are you going to do about it? Uh, what I'd like you to do about it is talk to your friends about it. And next time you go in and sit in at your seafood restaurant or your sushi bar, thump the table and say, I want to eat sustainably farmed fish, please. That is the way that we're going to be able to really change the world, which is what we're all out to do. So thank you very much. Uh, I've run on a little long winded, but then we did have the internet collapse in there. So forgive me, please. But uh, I'm happy to take questions for as long as the rest of you can bear my bellowing. I'll pass the microphone back to BFG, please. And appreciate it greatly. Thank you, Neil. That was very illuminating. Uh, and uh, we're now going to turn to the Q&A portion of our program where our speaker will address the questions uh, that have been sent in, uh, in advance. Those will be done first. And then we'll move to questions submitted via the chat function tonight. This is a good time to remind those of you who may have tuned in late that, our, that your participation confirms your consent to be recorded and appear in all online publications and rebroadcasts of this propeller. Our first question uh, has come in from David A. Smith, a regular propeller attendee at MIT and UC Berkeley alum. Uh, and this is what he would like to know. He has seen discussions about open ocean aquaculture, particularly seaweed sequestration of CO2, which you did mention. Uh, and he's wondering how this affects marine travel and if floating seaweed disturbs propellers on boats and if there are similar issues associated with protein aquaculture. Uh, this is, I think, primarily a question about the, the siting of offshore aquaculture operations and the whole uh, marine spatial planning issues here, which we've kind of figured that out for terrestrial systems pretty well, that uh, you don't go and um, expect to be able to uh, plant corn in the middle of a superhighway. Uh, similarly, you wouldn't want to go and locate a macroalgae culture operation uh, in the middle of an area that was heavily trafficked. But as we grow this industry and as we grow increasingly other marine based industries, as we must, given that it's 70% of the planet out there, that this, this is really part of our manifest destiny. If we're going to soften our footprint on the planet, we need to use the oceans more. And uh, it's, it's simply a matter of through a marine spatial planning process, being able to come to some compromises. No, you're not gonna be able to go and drive your boat all over the place through the middle of, of seaweed farms because the seaweed is gonna be grown close to the surface. Uh, and there'll be buoys and there'll be lines and there'll be risk to, if, if there are divers in the water, there'll be risk to those. And so there needs to be some uh, adjudicated 
moderated compromise for the use of the oceans and that the oceans and the whole concept of mares librum freedom of the seas being able to go anywhere and do what it wonderful romantic notion doesn't work really well on a planet of 10 billion people and that's what we need to plan for our next uh, question sent in in advance comes from Robert Ross, a Harvard and Georgetown alum with more than a passing interest in aquaculture. For more than three decades, Robert ran an agribusiness investment corporation in Latin America that funded thousands of projects in more than 30 countries, many in aquaculture. Uh, and here's the first of his two questions. Does climate change affect aquaculture? Uh, yes, indeed, it, 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 it will. Uh, climate change, or as I like to call it, the global climate crisis, let's please call it what it is, uh, is going to affect absolutely everything. Uh, actually, a, a Princeton alum, uh, Dr. Dane Klinger, who had done a postdoc in Steve Pakala's lab, has done some of the seminal work on this. Uh, and... Uh, if people want to reach out to me, I, I can put you in contact with Dr. Klinger. Uh, uh, Pakala's lab is, is there at Princeton. I think m most of you perhaps I would hope would know. Um, and so, it, yes, it is going, it's, it's going to open up areas of ocean that previously were not available for aquaculture to aquaculture and it's going to mean that fish in some other areas fish or seaweed or macroalgae are going to be increasingly stressed as well by by rising temperatures sea surface temperatures are increasing far greater than atmospheric temperatures but i think the united nations high level panel had highlighted this and it, it, it's a growing awareness amongst the marine science academia and ngo communities that as I'd said, that the oceans, we shouldn't be thinking of them so much as a victim of the global climate crisis, that they're an integral part of the solution. And the second question from Robert is, has the incidence of disease in aquaculture changed over the past two decades? And if so, how? This is actually a... a an area where aquaculture is often uh, held up for pillory, but where I think it is actually a phenomenal success story uh, that the application of uh, new technologies, both for selective breeding uh, or for prophylaxis or for treatment of diseases, just better mechanisms for fish health, for animal health in aquaculture, there have been phenomenal advances in, in, in the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, and these have been accompanied with other reductions in uh, potential inputs. Uh, back 30, 40 years ago, because when the engineering mandated that salmon pens in Norway were in really protected fjords with shallow water and poor circulation, they didn't really know what to be feeding the fish. And so they're just feeding them with cut bait and, and there were fish health issues that they would treat with the use of antibiotics. Uh, and th this is something that any biologist shudders when you, you, you think about this, because it, it, it's treatment with a chemical, it becomes a drug dependency. Who wants a drug dependency? What we've seen in the last 10 to 20 years has been a dramatic shift where selectively bred strains are more disease resistant and the culture systems have moved out into deeper water with better circulation, so it's better for overall fish health. The nutrition has improved tremendously, and the overall stress levels on the fish is significantly reduced. And so the fish are less susceptible to diseases, and when there is a potential for disease, they're vaccinated. And so the use for, for example, antibiotics in Norway has decreased to where it is now less than 0.5 of a percent, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here, but it is, there is a graph that shows the decline in use of antibiotics that, that has an asymptote very, very close to the zero and the production volume of salmon in Norway, 
which is it's currently at almost a million tonnes per year. Total global salmon production is around almost 3 million tonnes per year. And this has been done with significantly lessening uh, impact on, on animal health. So it really is a tremendous success story that should be celebrated. Okay, we'll now uh, move to questions submitted via the chat function. And uh, Neil, um, the first one right off the bat is something I had a feeling someone was going to ask about. Uh, and you and I had some conversation about it several days back. Uh, for those of you who read The New Yorker, uh, and I think that's quite a few of you, uh, an article appeared on um, fish farming last week, and uh, I thought it would come up. So here's the question. What is your response to the recent New Yorker article regarding the negative impact of fish farming in Gambia? Thank you very much, BFG. We knew this was coming. Yeah. And let me correct you, please. This was not an article on fish farming. This was an article on the fish meal, fish oil industry. And th th there's a significant difference there that the fish meal, fish oil industry, you know, taking sardines or anchovies or other so-called trash fish, which is a term that makes me shudder. There's no such thing as a fish that should go in the trash. But taking those uh, forage fish, as they're called, and turning them into fish meal, which is the protein, and fish oil, the, the, the lipids. Uh, and the fish meal and fish oil industries existed 30, 40 years ago. When I was an undergraduate, the Peruvian anchoveta fishery was the biggest fishery on the planet. And that's what we studied in terms of uh, learning about fisheries management. It's just back then, 30, 40 years ago, when there was just a very nascent aquaculture industry, most of those proteins and oils were fed to pigs or to chickens which is not the best and highest use of those, that the best use of fish meal really is to feed it to fish. Certainly the best use of fish oil, because the fish, the omega-3s that, that are so important for heart health, for you, the consumer, uh, the, 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 the EPA and DHA, you feed them to a chicken or a pig, and they will just burn them like any other lipid that just becomes part of the, the metabolic engine in, in, into the metabolic furnace. Whereas a fish is much more inclined to uh, store those, the EPA and the DHA, and then therefore make it available to the consumer. And so if you're going to have a, a fish meal and fish oil industry, then aquaculture is, is the, the best use of, of those resources. I think the, the article in the New Yorker it made a, 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 it was very disappointing in the way that it tied the two industries together. Uh, that it did not recognize the phenomenal advances that have occurred in aquaculture in the last 10 to 20 years in terms of replacement of fish meal and fish oil in fish diets. And the primary driver behind this has been just the, the, the scaling, the growth of aquaculture in and of itself and the recognition in the industry that we can't be dependent on the boom and bust of most of the forage fish fisheries. You all know of the Peruvian anchoveta. When El Nino happens, the Peruvian anchoveta fishery collapses because there's no longer that, maybe you don't know this. You, you know, am I speaking foreign language here? Yeah. My Spanish is terrible. The, the deep water upwelling that happens normally that drives the, the, the product primary productivity for the Peruvian anchoveta fishery. It's three to 6 million tons a year. Uh, in an El Nino year, that shuts off. And so you don't get the deep water upwelling, you don't get the nutrients. And so um, the, the, the fishery is a, a fraction of what it normally is. For aquaculture, if you're trying to build a sustainable, stable aquaculture industry, that's nightmarish. That, that has fish meal, fish oil prices yo-yoing all over the place. Far better if you can go and peg your feed prices. Remember I'd mentioned earlier, feed is 60 to 70% of your cost of goods in an offshore aquaculture operation. Far better if you can peg that to something much more stable price-wise and, and where you can, and, and scalable 
where you can grow the production. And that's where the interest in soy and corn protein and wheat protein, canola. Essentially what we're doing here is turning a lot of these so-called carnivorous fish into vegetarians. And that's again, something to be celebrated. The article did a huge disservice by smearing aquaculture with that tarred brush when really the story was highlighting the problems when you have a very poorly managed forage fish fishery, the lack of environmental sensitivity of a lot of Chinese companies that are going in and setting up in Africa, and the problems with fisheries management for any resource in a, a strained economy such as you'd have in Gambia. That really should have been the crux of the story, and I've got beef with that author. Thanks, BFG. I, I had a beef too, and I did something I've never done before. I wrote them a letter. Okay, next. Um, are you familiar with the work of Seafood Watch? It distinguishes between different fish farmers, and is that helping or hurting the public adoption of farmed fish? Very familiar with the, the Seafood Watch program. For those of you that don't know it, it, it's affiliated with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So a lot of you might know it as, oh, that's the Monterey Bay Aquarium stop sign, uh, stoplight system uh, of red, orange, green. Uh, green being approved for unlimited consumption, red being avoid, uh, and amber, orange being proceed with caution. Uh, and uh, I, I still correspond quite regularly with, with the, the chap who is with Ocean Conservancy now. He had been the head of the uh, Seafood Watch program in the days when we were running the, the Kona Kampachi operation here in, in Hawaii. And I'd reached out to them and said, Kampachi, it's a new fish to the market. We'd like you to come and do an assessment on the, this fish. And brought them out and took them out, put a mask and snorkel and a scuba tank on them and threw them in the water on the dive site. And I still remember there were two of them that had come out to do, to do that assessment. And the, the, the second one, I had known his work. He, he'd, I'd never heard him speak in a complimentary manner of any aquaculture operation previously, but he came up from that dive. And it was one of those dives on the farm site here in Kona is, is just gorgeous water quality and there were dolphins and there were giant trevally and there were bait fish swirling around. It was a beautiful morning. He came up from the, the dive and he took off his tank and he turned and said, Neil, I never thought I'd say this, but I think I've finally seen a sustainable fish farm. And they went and proceeded, went through the whole Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch program assessment and ranked us as we were the first net pen operation ever to receive anything other than a red avoid ranking. We got the orange, okay, good alternative ranking, uh, which was a, still a disappointment to me. I wanted the green, but the, 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 the ranking system was set up such that if you were a net pen system, you were never going to be able to achieve green. They since changed that and they're a lot more progressive, uh, about, they're, they're a lot more receptive to the idea of, of net pen culture, so long as it's done in a responsible manner. Remember, Monterey Bay Aquarium, Julie Packard, connect the dots here, if you will. Julie Packard, Packard Foundation, and the funding that's going into the UCSB uh, Bren School work that is so illuminating on so many aspects of the scalability of marine aquaculture. So I think that that is really telling, as well as whatever certification your local fish farm achieves. Uh, our next question is how to bring back cod. That's a tough one. I could have a minute to think about that. That's because yes. it's been 28 years since the fishery collapsed and nobody's come up with a good idea yet. <laughs> so give, give me a minute, please. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly, they're not coming back, BFG. I, I think that is over. That there has been a, whatever it is, the, the, the dynamic in the ocean that allowed that cod to be, that, that fish to be so abundant 
we have ruined it. We've destroyed it. Uh, and it's part of the tragedy of what we can do without even knowing. I mean, cod were uh, the fish that changed the world. If, if you, uh, the, the, the Mark Kurlansky book, I would recommend that to anybody that want, wants to read more. Uh, it, it was an iconic fish. There were marine biologists in the 1800s that would gush about how they could never imagine how this fishery could ever be overfished. There's just so many cod. You could walk across the backs of them in, in the shallows. And we are able to do it. We're pretty good. If you put a profit motive on a common property resource and you don't manage it rigorously, this is what happens. Next question is, uh, biofouling is a widespread concern. Can you expand on the concern over it? I know you, you've said quite a bit about it, but it sounds like this person wants more. Uh, so a widespread concern from biofouling. Um, just to be clear, biofouling is marine organisms growing where you don't want them to. So it's kind of like marine weeds can be either plants or invertebrates, just stuff that sticks to the bottom of your boat or to the pilings in, in a dock. Perhaps if we could have that, that question, that question could, could elaborate a, a, a little more, please, because I think Elizabeth. yes, biofouling is, is an issue in the way that it will occlude netting, but we've been able to resolve that with the use of the copper alloy nets or the uh, monofilament terephthalate. Neil, we're going to ask uh, Elizabeth Powers, uh, an attorney in Boston, to unmute and the two of you can talk to each other. Sure. Thanks, Elizabeth. Can you unmute, Elizabeth? Sure, I can do that. Yeah, no, and this comes from, you know, from a long time ago where the, the, the main concern about the, the fish farming was and the biofouling and, and the impact on the, the more local environment. But but in particular, the effect that it had on the fish itself, so that when you were, when you had the fish, you had this, they were bred in this environment that was not necessarily a, um, a good environment. So, it, it, and it sounds like you might've addressed that with, you know, some of the comments that you made. We, we'd, I'd heard about antibiotics, I'd heard about, you know, all the issues with buying fish that had been farmed and, and with Seafood Watch even, they make it, they have a range of, you can buy from some bio farmers and not others and some fish that are farm raised are better than others. And so that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, so I think the, the biofouling per se, the, 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 the um, animals that w will attach to netting, that had been a, a significant issue when people were still using nylon nets and particularly because the bio, they wanted to be able to control the biofouling, they were using uh, copper paint, the same sort of paint that you would use on the bottom of a boat to prevent the biofouling on the netting. Uh, and copper is highly toxic and, and the, the, the copper paint would ablate off the netting or crack as, as the netting is malleable. Uh, and there would be accumulations of copper in the substrate beneath the net pens. And this had the inevitable event, inevitable impact of, of you were getting uh, no growth of, of uh, invertebrates. Invertebrates in, in the marine environment are highly sensitive to copper toxicity. Uh, and, and so, yes, that was a, a huge problem. And what has happened... Uh, in the last 10 to 20 years uh, is both increasing use of, of copper alloy or um, monofilament netting such as the Kiko net uh, and also just better uh, engineering to allow more rapid changes of netting. And so uh, when you do get biofouling, you get perhaps a heavy set of muscles onto a netting that before those muscles grow to a size where you can get in there and pull that netting out, get it ashore, get it cleaned and get it back in. So they're not having to use the uh, highly toxic 
copper paints anymore. And I think in most jurisdictions now that the use of copper-based anti-fouling paints on netting is prohibited. If it's not prohibited, it's highly discouraged and you can't get ASC certification or Monterey Bay Aquarium recognition if you're still using copper-based paints. So it's it's not an issue anymore, but it's just it's a cost of doing business of you know clean, cleaning your netting so that you can maintain a good flow of water there and maintain fish health. Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth. That is a, a good a good segue actually into the next question. One of the distinctions made by Seafood Watch between good farmed fish and less favorable farmed fish is based on how the fish health is managed. How is the industry regulated to ensure good, healthy farming? <clears throat> the main elements of good fish health management are the same as the sorts of elements for any other sort of, of uh, monocropping. It's primarily siting uh of your operation in the right location you know, that, that you know, growing cows in colorado uh is a lot better than growing them in central park um it, it's uh then you know the experience and the expertise in your management team to be able to minimize the stresses on the animal that there's increasing recognition that, that it's actually stress renders fish vulnerable to infection uh, and so that's the lower densities, that's really good nutrition uh, and uh, just general not crowding the fish and, and not uh, exposing them to you know, water temperatures uh, or low oxygen levels that, that might be stressful to the fish. Uh, it's, uh, Sorry, the second part of that question, BFG, I've lost the thread. Well, um, is, is anybody regulating uh, these, uh, their definitions? It's, these people have come up with apparently less favorable or good healthy right. farming. And um, I, I think, I think the, the heart of the question is, is anybody, has anyone made regulations that have teeth in them that are part of the industry or is it kind of each person doing his or her own thing? Uh, my understanding is that in the US there, and in most jurisdictions, there aren't regulations around things like fish density or, or the quality of your feed or the, the, the management of the fish on the farm. Uh, but there are, remember I, I, the first element that I'd said that is really critical is sighting. And this is why in Norway now, the re thing that's really driving these massive structures for offshore fish farms in Norway is that you cannot get a permit anymore for more protected waters. The only permits that are being issued for farms in Norway are out in highly exposed waters. So in Turkey, they, Turkey is now the biggest producer of European sea bass and sea brim in the Mediterranean. And about 10 years ago, the Turkish government said, okay, no more inshore fish farms. Sorry, all of you have got to move out to where you're at least a kilometer offshore and at least in 33 meters of water. And you've got to have at least this much 0.2 centimeters per second current. So those sorts of regulations. Air, examples of where regulations have not managed the siting well. You've all seen the photos of fish farms in Asia, where it is literally cheek by jowl of, of net pens over some protected bay with the, the, the net pens and the houses literally wall to wall as far as you can see. Um, in Chile, in the, the industry there grew so quickly, the salmon farming industry uh, in the 1990s, there was very little regulation about where uh, permits were issued for farms in relation to the other adjacent farms there. And so still you have uh, this issue in Chile where there are too many fish grown in the 10th region and not enough, you know, there should have been an expansion, a mandated expansion down to the 11th and 12th regions down in, into the, the deeper parts of Patagonia. Um, 
my co-founder in the Mexican farm had actually been one of the pioneers that had moved, voluntarily moved their company's operation from the 10th region uh, right down into uh, the Straits of Magellan down in, in Patagonia there. And he had said the reason that he did that is he could see that there was no regulation happening in the 10th region and that there was going to be a fish health crisis there. And it did eventuate uh, over time that they did have disease outbreaks there that really decimated the industry. So most jurisdictions will review a citing application. In the US, for example, you could probably go and get a, a net pen permit for federal, you couldn't get it for federal waters. Let me think this through. That, that there's not a lot of, of specific regulation over where you cite your pen, but through the whole permitting process that there is vetting of does this make sense? So it's not clearly specified regulations, but it's the whole NEPA National Environmental Protection Act review process that scrubs any proposal pretty rigorously for potential impacts. Okay, so let me make sure I understand this. Uh, what I'm getting uh, out of this is that it's largely regulated by country and sometimes by some region within a country, but there's no overarching global regulatory uh, commission or mechanism. Is that right? That, that's correct, yes. But what will we, what we move has, that way at some point? Wouldn't you think we'll have to? No, I, I don't know no more than there being some global uh, overarching regulation of, of dairy farming or uh, you know, chicken farming. It's going to happen on, on a, a, a national or a state level uh, a, a, as it, it should. But what you do have in aquaculture, because seafood is uh, one of the, the most traded uh, commodities on, on the planet. I think oil is the only more trade, internationally traded commodity. Uh, and so you have the potential through market forces to drive improvement in the production systems. And that's what the Aquaculture Stewardship Council does. And I think that's how it would differentiate itself from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch uh, scorecard system certifies industries generally rather than individual farms. It certified our operation here in Hawaii because we were the only American Kampachi producer. But generally they certify you know, a, a, an industry or a, a national industry. Um, you know, Norwegian salmon versus Chilean salmon, uh, Ecuadorian shrimp, versus Peruvian shrimp. Uh, but what the Aquaculture Stewardship Council does is actually certify individual farm operators. And so that moves the accountability down to the individual operator. And so for us to get the ASC certification in Mexico, we had to go through a very rigorous audit system there to meet the requirements of ASC. And so it's not a, a regulation, it's not a stick, it's using the carrot, using the market recognition of the ASC uh, logo, the, the ASC brand that increases market access. Uh, and that's, I think, much more effective rather than your regulations should be the bare minimum. It really, but to be able to drive meaningful change, you want to be able to have incentives, market incentives pushing those. Okay, the next one's pretty easy. I might even answer it, but I'm going to let you answer it. Why? Do they add color to Atlantic salmon? Uh, do, they don't actually add color to Atlantic salmon. That's a, a, a um, specious uh, smear that has arisen because of California regulations that, that somehow California legislators were uh, talked into doing this by anti-aquaculture activists to saying now in California, you have to say, you know, color added when you are selling salmon. The salmon is not, the, the color is not added to the salmon. The color is added to the salmon diet. And the color usually is, it, it, it's a, a pigment that is a, a regular part of salmon diet in the wild. 
And if, you, if it's not included in the salmon diet in a, for a farm salmon, then it's not a nutritionally balanced diet, that it's important for um, the, the, the health of the animal for it to be able to have this. And so it, it, it's not that there is often this perception that, that uh, th these pigments are added after the fish has been slaughtered in, in a way that's going to hoodwink the consumer. No, this is just fish nutritionists that are adding these pigments in there because they're an integral part of uh, the, the salmon's diet. Thank you for making that clear to everyone. Uh, I'm happy to hear it. That's what I thought you'd say. Um, okay, next question. Uh, I think you already talked about this. Uh, can seaweed be used for animal feed, not just fertilizer? I, I think you went through that, didn't you? Yes, we would hope that it could be used more. Um, you know, there are, I think, the, the Orkney Islands. There's some islands in the Orkneys where the sheep actually eat seaweed all the time and seem to do perfectly fine. But generally, seaweed, because it's the reason why it's so rubbery to feel, is they're really complex uh, uh, hydrocarbons in, in, in there. That the, the polysaccharides give it that rubbery feel, and they're very difficult to digest. Uh, and so most terrestrial animals don't do very well on a predominantly seaweed diet. But what we are looking at, and increasingly th th there's exploration uh, in, in a number of European countries are looking at ways that you can partially decompose the seaweed, deconstruct the seaweed, uh, so that th these polysaccharides become uh, broken down and become more bioavailable to uh, ruminants in particular. Okay, um, I'm going to modify this question to make it more general. Uh, certain well-known purveyors of fish say that their products that they sell are sustainable. Is that true? And what does it actually mean? I did that, that without naming was, names. <laughs> that, that question is always fraught. Uh, <laughs> sustainable is so subjective. And now I'm actually, full disclosure here. I should have perhaps said this earlier. I'm actually act actively involved in the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. I am uh, serve on their technical advisory committee uh, because I, I, I really admire all of what ASC strives to do in terms of improving overall global aquaculture. And the Aquaculture Stewardship Council does not claim to certify sustainable seafood because that's such a woolly issue. And you start talking about sustainability and immediately people have got beef with you. But what uh, they, they say is that they certify environmentally and socially responsible aquaculture. And I think that's a, a, a much more helpful definition rather than the definition of sustainability is that you could continue doing this for future generations without detracting from uh, the uh, overall planet's res resources. Uh, and uh, it, it's very difficult to define that. People like to use it a lot in terms of fisheries, wild stock fisheries that's sustainably fished. Uh, you know, Alaskan, wild Alaskan salmon often claims to be sustainable uh, and on the face of it, yes, you would say it is because there's a lot more salmon caught in the wild in Alaska now than there was 30, 40, 50 years ago. The reason is that the recruitment is supplemented by massive hatchery production. Billions of fish are released into the North Pacific from uh, Russia, Canada, US, Alaska, um, and, and the northern, uh, the, the North Pacific Northwest on the US and Japan, billions of salmon smolts are released into the ocean. And that increases the catch in a year or two when those fish will return. But is that sustainable? You have no idea what sort of an impact those billions of smolts are having on the wider ecosystem. And that really needs to be examined a little bit more closely, I think, before you go and make some sweeping claims of sustainability. 
Okay, Neil, um, we have a number of other questions, but um, um, people can uh, send them to you directly and we'll explain how at the end of the program. So I'm going to just take one more question and it actually um, relates to a topic that the propellers did um, oh, probably in the last year or two. Uh, and here's the question. Uh, it's linking that topic and your topic. Is there a possible synergistic partnership between offshore aquaculture and offshore wind turbine installations? For example, in building wind turbine infrastructure, could aquaculture be piggybacked to some extent during and or after the wind turbine infrastructure construction with any possible resulting net synergistic benefit being shared between the two industries partnering in one installation? Great question. I think so too, and a great way to end. Yeah, and one that I uh, get frequently both from forums like this and then through my email. Probably once a month I get some grad, engineering grad student or, or somebody else involved in investment or, or uh, in the industry, in the wind industry itself saying, hey, what about sustainable energy sources for offshore aquaculture and wave energy or, or wind energy? And I always like to point out to folk that whilst we're not nervous about going out offshore, far offshore. We do look for sites that are low energy in terms of wave and wind because it's bouncy and you don't like it bouncy. We like it generally to be a little calmer. It makes it a lot easier to work. Uh, and there's less chance of, of people getting hurt. Um, and so that, that's the main primary driver why for our Villela Epsilon project in the Gulf of Mexico. We're over off Sarasota rather than being off Texas. There's a lot deeper water closer to shore in Texas, but it's about twice as much wave energy on Texas. Uh, and so generally we will seek out sites that are, are lower wave energy, less wind energy. And I don't really see a lot of synergy for co-location other than if you are constrained in the availability of sites, if it's really difficult for you to get a site for your net pens, then perhaps people wouldn't mind so much if you went and dotted your net pens in between the wind turbines. Um, if you're willing to put up with the, 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 the wind and the waves that that brings with it. But the idea of using uh, wind energy or wave energy to power an offshore aquaculture operation, that that's, doesn't really make a, a lot of sense in terms of the practicality of it. Um, that a, a, a alternative energy operation out offshore like that is going to be scaled to power a city. And what you've got there is a net pen operation where most of your power draws are real, usually very small as for monitoring you know, video cameras and, and lighting and things for monitoring the site. And when you do want power, you want a lot of it and it needs to be really reliable. And it's for things like uh, augers and pumps to feed the fish or for um, hydraulics to be able to harvest the fish. And so it, it needs to be really intense power Diesel fuel or other liquid fuels are really efficient at providing that sort of energy over a short pulse. Uh, and it's really difficult to see it being cost effective to tie into a grid with a, a, another sort of energy system such as wind or wave power. Great notion, perhaps there's some way, in the, um, I, I would never be one to say never, and I'd encourage folk to keep banging on my door with, with, with ideas. Like you, I never say never either. Uh, so as all of you continue to think about this subject, we know you have more questions and, and more may continue to occur to you. So at the end of tonight's credits, do watch for that slide uh, that will include how you can reach Neil directly. And I'm sure he'll address your questions. Our thanks to Neil 
for tonight's talk and for helping us sort out the sea of diverse opinions and perspectives on offshore aquaculture and its role in meeting world protein demand. We also want to thank our attendees, an increasingly far-flung audience of entrepreneurs, navigators, and the curious. Until we meet again, you can reach us by emailing propellers at princetonaaa.org. Your comments help us shape future propellers as we continue to seek stimulating and ever thought provoking topics with the potential to practically improve our lives and our world. And now wherever you are in Asia, Oceania, Europe or the Americas, it's time to say aloha. Our next propeller flight will be Tuesday, April 13th, 2021, 7 p. Eastern US time. Please mark your calendars. Until then, this is B.F. Graham on behalf of the Princeton Propellers signing off and wishing you high spirits and happy landings. <laughs>